My name is Rocky Rashidi. I'm the Senior Product Manager for Advanced Analytics with an Exabeam. And as Cynthia said, with me, I have my colleague Abel Morales. He's a regional sales engineer with Exabeam as well. Just a brief in, uh, agenda as far as what we're talking about today. We'll go over the MITRE ATT&CK framework, just so sort I of get everybody familiarized with it, what it is, what it does. Um, we'll sort of do a small, tiny, you know, 30 second, one minute primer on IOCs. Um, I'm gonna compare IOCs to TTPs, and then we'll talk about our integration, the integration between advanced analytics and MITRE. And then we'll do a quick demo with the help of my friend, Abel. Well, we're talking about the MITRE ATT&CK framework because as we can all see, the interest has dramatically grown. Um, since 2018, all the way up to now, there's constant buzz around it, especially around the framework, and in general, tactics, techniques, and procedures. So what is MITRE, or better yet, who is MITRE? They're a not-for-profit company, they're federally funded, and they're tasked with researching various different threats, and they also maintain the CVE database. Now, ATT&CK stands for, it's a framework, it stands for Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge and it's developed based on observations of real life attack behaviors. So what does this all do and what does MITRE give us? What problem does it solve? Well, for managers, they can now efficiently assess coverage um, against certain specific attacks. For analysts, it allows them to quickly identify threats and make better informed decisions on how to remediate them. Just to get ourselves familiarized with the layout of the matrix, this is what it looks like. Now, at the top, what we see is tactics. The tactics tell you what's being done, the stage. The techniques are essentially given common names to different procedures. Essentially, it's the how. The framework provides information about uh, summary of the specific technique, uh, mitigation rules, known attacks that it was used in. You can think of it as the Wikipedia of attacks. Some examples of techniques are, for example, spear phishing links, um, account manipulation or account creation. Now, when we talk about the MITRE framework, we cannot help but to think of it as something like the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. It is, however, a little bit different. The MITRE attack framework focuses on post-exploit lifecycle. So we just went over the framework, small overview of what it was and what it gives us. It allows us to better detect threats by grouping them into techniques and giving these techniques essentially a common name. Now, let's take a step back. Let's go ahead and talk about IOCs, and let's sort of compare and contrast, you know, which one should we use? What is the difference here? We all know about IOCs. They're essentially breadcrumbs left behind by an attacker. However, just because something was malicious at some point doesn't mean that it's still malicious now. And simply that is not just enough. So tactics, techniques, and procedures, or as we call them, TTPs, these are things that we get from the MITRE framework. They give us the what, and the how, and indicate patterns that analysts should be on the lookout for. IOCs can change. However, behavior and patterns usually stay consistent. Trying to get initial access, for example, into a system could be done by having a specific exploit for a specific application. However, rather than chasing that specific application or a specific exploit or monitoring a hash, we can see the pattern here is trying to find a way into a public-facing application. Now, looking a little bit deeper into IOCs, they do have their challenges and they do have their problems. And that's why relying on IOCs simply is not enough for a few different reasons. Well, first and foremost, IOCs are single dimension. Um, we need more identifiers, we need more observables, we need more artifacts to essentially enrich these IOCs. And there are the known knowns. If something is known, well, we know what it is. But we have to hope that we're not patient zero. A lot of times they also lack context. And they're also valid for a very short period of time. Again, if an IP address known to be malicious or had a low reputation back in 2015, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad now. They're also polymorphic. Names change, IP addresses change, file hashes change. And they also give you a false sense of security. So let's just say you specify a specific type of attack and there is about 800, 900, 1,000 IP addresses that are involved in that attack. Great, so we're gonna go on and build 800, 900 different correlation rules. And then it gives you this false sense of security that now I am covered, but that's not the case. So we talked about IOCs. 
We talked about TTPs. We talked about some of the, dis the disadvantages of IOCs and just going by IOCs alone. So let's talk about how using Exabeam, Advanced Analytics, and the MITRE framework together is beneficial to the SOC. As mentioned, MITRE gives us techniques and tactics. For example, account creation. However, not all instances of account creation are bad. So Advanced Analytics, we take in all the account creation events, all instances of account creation. We analyze them based on our machine learning and our models, and we alert you only on the anomalous behavior. We eliminate alert fatigue. So you have IT creating accounts or HR creating accounts. Now, the interest in MITRE has grown, as well as the MITRE database itself. Total right now, there's about 291 different techniques within the MITRE framework, and we're proud to be the only vendor in our space that has actually contributed a technique to the MITRE framework itself. You can go out and find that under Domain Generation Algorithm. Now, at the core of this integration between Advanced Analytics and the MITRE, uh, and the MITRE framework integration is our content team. They have mapped out our risk reasons and our triggered rules to 51 different techniques. And we also have the potential to cover up to 180 different techniques out of the 291 that exist today. Let's take a look at what Exabeam shows today. Many of you are familiar with this. Um, this is, for example, how a pass the hash attack would look like in Exabeam. We have the event. We have the event details on the left-hand side. And we have fired a specific triggered rule as it associates with this event based on our models. Now, this event, or these events, anomalous events, are in our timelines. So that way, the analyst can sort of see what happened after, what happened before. Now, a lot of our rules are behavior-based. We detect what is abnormal and why it's abnormal, as I mentioned, based on our machine learning algorithm. And we fire off the proper rules based on our models. So now we've taken this one step further. Based on the mapping that we've done between our risk reasons, i.e. triggered rules, and the MITRE tactics and techniques, we now are able to tag a specific risk reason within a timeline and show you the specific technique that it associates with. So now, let's take an example. Let's say you have three notable users. And every notable user, each of these guys, has one rule in the timeline. Now that rule has, each of them are different, a little bit different, but they all have something to do with someone mucking around with an account. Whether it's escalating a privilege, whether it's creating an account, whether it's accessing an account. Now the analyst has to go to every single one of these timelines, look at what happened after, what happened before, to sort of see what behavior is taking place. You have to spend time doing this. Well now, all three of these techniques, they correlate to one, all three of these triggered rules correlate to one single technique as an example, account creation, or in this case, file deletion. And an analyst could immediately and very efficiently assess what the threat is and what actions needs to be taken. So now, we talked about the content, we talked about the detection and how we show this within the timeline, but now we've taken it one step further. We now allow the analyst and your threat hunting teams to threat hunt based on MITRE techniques and tactics and not just IOCs. So within Threat Hunter, you can go ahead and threat hunt based on a specific rule, for example, a risk reason. However, you might not know all the risk reasons that are in the system, or you might not know which risk reason associates to what technique. You don't need to. You can put in the name of the technique, and the results will come. And even better yet, let's just say you want to assess your security posture or assess a specific type of attack. Let's just say an AP232 style attack. So rather than knowing everything that it entails, you can go ahead and put in the name of all the techniques that are associated with that, and that information is available on the MITRE, on the, on the MITRE uh, site itself. And then you can save that. And for example, that'll be an APT32 style attack safe, safe search based on techniques and tactics within MITRE. And that is what my colleague, Abel Morales, will be demoing for you guys today. Hey, good morning, everyone. So how many of you guys are adjusting or adapting the MITRE attack framework today? Is that, is that something initiative? Cool, so not long ago, I was actually in your shoes. I was a principal incident handler at Verizon, and I held other roles in other organizations in security ops, so that's been my entire background. And one of the things that I find very difficult to do with the MITRE attack framework is figuring out well, how would we write this rule today in a traditional sim. So think about RDP, remote desktop protocol. 
if you were to go to your sim today and then just query for 4624's type 10, which is an interactive login, how would your analyst define on what's possibly nefarious or what's actually benign? So that was one of the challenges that I constantly have where creating that content was very difficult within the MITRE ATT&CK framework. That's kind of where Exabeam comes into play in helping you identify those, uh, those anomalies. One of the things I'd like to do is I'm gonna dive into this user, Frederick Weber. And one of the things, of course, that we're very big on is understanding the context of users, understanding exactly who they are to make analysts a lot more efficient. So just to preface this, this is an organization in this demo environment that the web developer has complained and has obtained uh, domain admi admin privileges because they need some uh, certain access to certain uh, processes and certain systems. So the IT team, instead of trying to figure out what exactly they need, just gave them domain admin privileges. So now we have a web developer with domain admin privileges. Not a, not a bad scenario. So scrolling down here, we have our user risk trend. I think a lot of us are familiar with it, but we have the ability to zoom out here and look at it from a, a different lens for a month. So for those of you not familiar with advanced analytics, each session or each dot that you see here represents a, a session. Could be the time that somebody badges in, time that someone badges out, logs in through the VPN or logs in on a system. Now if we're scrolling down, you see we have some risk reasons listed here of what aggregated this user's risk score to, uh, to where it's at today at 672 points. And the way we do this is we prioritize the highest risk up top and then to the least risk in the bottom. So one of the things that kind of catches my eye here is we have this suspicious uh, pass the hash attack. Here we give you the description and we also give you the rule. So we tag the rule associated with that specific trigger. The analyst also has the ability to just click on the rule itself and it will populate a quick write up of what that means. And I think this is very important because I've ran into certain situations where I've done some actual testing on tools. Uh, for example, trying to query the domain admins on this particular uh, domain, just to make sure that the tool is triggered. Uh, shortly after, the analysts contacted me and say, hey, you're running a malicious file known as net1.exe. And that was not really what the alert was for, it was the fact that I was querying a domain control, or querying the domain control for domain admins. So let's dive into the timeline and let's just kind of understand a little bit more on how MITRE ties into the x platform. As we're scrolling down here, um, we see well, there's some interesting events that are, are taking place here. Uh, let's look here. So we have this web access here of zoomer.cn. That looks pretty interesting. You can click on the event itself and you can see that this has been tagged as a drive-by compromise. You can click on the models and you can see some additional information of why we, we flag this as anomalous. And this is one of the things that I had a lot of issues with working in a traditional sim. How do analysts today determine what is anomalous and what's not? Most of the time, an analyst is having to spend uh, some time investing six months of data, maybe three months, two weeks, depending on how far they need to go back, and then they're arbitrarily making that, uh, that decision of what, what is normal, what's not for that user. As we scroll down, we see we have this barbarian.jar file. Uh, this is uh, pretty interesting. We can click on it and we can see that this is tagged with user execution. Again, the biggest thing is giving your analysts a lot of context and understanding what it is that they need to look for. Why is this something that we flagged? And in this case, we tie back the MITRE attack framework into this rule. We also have a hard alert uh, subsequently followed by that. Then we have this process execution for WinWord. Uh, this is pretty, pretty interesting just because of the command that was executed. And this command is essentially designed to delete a uh, file. In this case, it's this binary that executed on the system. And we do the same type of modeling as well. One of the things that I always tell people is I, I'm a big fan, proponent of endpoint detection and response tools. I think one thing that we do very well is we can give you some additional visibility into process executions. An example of that is I worked on an actual live incident where our EDR tool didn't flag on control two cap and it was actually modified. For those of you not familiar with control two cap, control two cap is part of the sys internal suite, something actually created by Microsoft. However, there was an embedded code on it to make it into an actual keylogger. That's not something that there was an actual signature for or something that the EDR system uh, had in its database to let us know it's bad. However, it did log it. 
In that case, one of the things that we do very well is that we model also the process executions. In this case, this is a process that would have been flagged as, hey, we've never seen this process executed within your environment. So as we're scrolling down, we also see VSS admin, uh, BCD edit. As a lot of us are familiar, these are processes typically used within ransomware and also within malware. Um, you can also click on the descriptions, you can click on the models, and we'll flag those for you as well. And let's keep scrolling down. The other part too is I'm also a big proponent of lateral movement. How does lateral movement actually happen? I've seen cases in actual incidents, not only do, does it occur through remote desktop protocol, it could happen through PS exec, WMI, PowerShell, a lot of different ways. And again, the hardest part is understanding what it is that you're actually looking for. Most of the time, from my experience, the only way to identify lateral movement is that there was something else that gave you some type of hint or some type of alert, and then you're searching for that type of IOC, whether it's the actual host name, the compromised user account, maybe the IP from where they're VPNing from, and it makes it very difficult to be proactive on how you detect lateral movement. I've had cases where we didn't find out until a year later that the adversary was within our network because we didn't have a good way of identifying lateral movement within the environment. In this case, this is something that Exabeam does very well. We're able to identify remote access, uh, anything that looks interesting. For example, the first time someone has access a system, we're able to do that and tie that back into, uh, into the MITRE ATT&CK framework as well. If we're scrolling down, let's uh, keep going here. We see some interesting remote access. The one I'd like to focus on is we see a remote logon to this domain controller, DC233. And we've also tagged that with past the hash. This is the one that we saw earlier in the risk reasons. Again, the biggest, biggest thing about what we do is we're putting this into an organized timeline. If you kind of think about some of the big incident response uh, companies out there that come in, they're in the, in the business of generating timelines. We do that for you automatically. Uh, we stitch everything together to make it very simple for the analyst to understand what happened before, during, and then after. So we're scrolling down. The next thing we see after the pass the hash into the domain controller, we also see there's an account switch over to some other privilege user. And that looks like this is the first time this has happened. You can actually hover over it, and you can see this is a user switched account as well. Again, you can click on that, and you can see there's an exploitation for privilege escalation. You can click on it, and it'll give you a description. Now lastly, as you scroll down, you can also see that there's a hard alert from Palo Alto Wildfire, and you can see that there's some data exfiltration um, occurring from the uh, domain controller, of course, from SVC hosts. So in this case, what we've done is we've started tagging these rules to make it very simple for analysts to understand what they're looking at and how that ties back into the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Everyone's adopting it. A lot of security operations centers are measuring their detection matur maturity against the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So this is a beneficial way of kind of incorporating that into your process today. And then the, the last thing that I will mention that Rocky uh, had mentioned prior, you can also do that, uh, these searches through the uh, through Threat Hunter. So you can click on these rule tags and you can look for like user execution. You can click on it and then you can click search and it'll populate any user execution that's identified as anomalous within the organization. Uh, just out of curiosity, just to, uh, just to understand, is anyone here kind of threat, doing like some type of threat profiling, understanding what APT groups typically target? You get targets you, okay. So I'm not sure if anyone's, everyone's familiar with this or not, but I'll just touch on it real quick. MITRE ATT&CK has this navigator tool, which is pretty awesome. And what they've done, they've integrated the different TTPs associated with the APT groups. So in this case, if I'm interested in like an APT1, you can select that and you can color code it and see all the TTPs associated with that specific APT group. Now in turn, kind of what Rocky mentioned before, you can kind of operationalize this and then create those saved uh, threat hunter searches within advanced analytics, and you can kind of see, hey, is this something that's happening in my environment associated with an APT group? 